We should be live. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Five Can't Miss EKGs with Jennifer Carlquist. So this webinar is brought to you by EB Medicine and UCA. EB Medicine helps urgent care clinicians get up to speed quickly and stay current on the latest evidence so you can feel confident treating patients in an urgent care setting. Plus, we make earning CME credit easy and affordable. My name is Jeff Owens. I'm a practicing PA and education consultant here at EB Medicine, and I'll be your moderator for today's events. During the presentation, everyone will be in listen-only mode. If you're unable to hear or see the presentation, or if you have any other technical issues, um, you can send a message through the chat or visit ebmedicine.net slash contact. If you have any questions for today's speaker, you can submit them at any time during the webinar or at the end during our live Q&A using the ask a question feature at the bottom of your screen. You can also see the questions that others have asked. And if you think a question is particularly important and would like to be sure the speaker addresses it, you can upvote it by clicking the arrow on the left hand side of the question. So I'd like to thank EB Medicine and UCA again for making this event possible. After the presentation, you'll get a brief demo of EB Medicine's latest product, the Urgent Care EKG course. And if you stay till the end, you'll get a special bonus. This presentation will be recorded and be available to all registrants within one week. Now on to today's session. So I'd like to introduce you to Jennifer Carlquist. Jennifer has practiced in cardiology and emergency medicine for the past 15 years. She began her career in medicine as a paramedic and developed a passion for cardiology. Jennifer has developed and delivered many education programs on cardiology related topics, including high risk presentations and how to identify subtle ischemia on EKGs. Jennifer is recognized as a leading expert in EKG interpretation. In today's webinar, Jennifer will give you a process and a practice for spotting five concerning arrhythmias you can't afford to get wrong on EKGs. She will teach you the, how to plot the patterns and read between the lines so you can make good catches instead of misses. The presentation is about 40 minutes, and then we'll have a live Q&A, followed by a demonstration of the Urgent Care EKG course. Enjoy. Thank you, Jeff. Really appreciate that kind intro. And welcome, everybody, to today's webinar. I'm super excited to bring this presentation to you because, uh, as many of you know, I, I know a lot of you who are on today, this is a very, very hot topic, and it's one thing I'm really passionate about sharing with you. So without further ado, let's get started. My disclosures are that I do teach EKG courses for Zola Life Fest, but I will not be talking about the vest today. And there is no real patience or faces in this presentation that are going to be demonstrated today. Now, let's go on to our presentation. How this is going to work is we're going to have basically an urgent care. So you can see we've got all our rooms here. It's it's an old urgent care because we've got paper charts, which is so exciting. And we're going to go from room to room together, seeing patients, and we're going to find out a little bit more about them as we, we reach them. So this is Mr. Phil, of course, again, not a real patient's face. And uh, he's complaining of some chest discomfort. Now, Phil's had chest pain for three days. And he unfortunately says, I know it hurts so much. I know I've taken five nitroglycerin today, but I just don't want to go to the emergency room. Now, I think in urgent care, our struggle is always deciding who actually needs to go to urgent care and or the emergency department, right? And who we can safely work up in urgent care. This is pretty clear that we're not going to keep him in the urgent care department because he's had five nitro pain for three days, and he looks really uncomfortable. Pretty much no matter what his EKG says, right? We're going to send him off. But in the meantime, because we're in five can't miss EKGs, we're going to get an EKG on him. And here it is. Now, with Phil, he does have an additional layer of history, which is concerning. He had a stress test that was done several months ago, nuclear, but he never followed up. And it was actually positive. So you kind of already have a, you know, a hint that something is really, really wrong with him. But when you look at the EKG, is there anything that sticks out? Now, I just realized V5 and V6 got, or V4 through V6 got cut off. But the findings that we really need to see are actually in V2 and V3. Okay, so he's, first of all, he's not a STEMI. 
and the machine's not calling this to me, but he's also not meeting criteria. And that's the thing we always look for first, but there's other things, and that's what we're gonna talk about in this lecture, that are not STEMI, but are just as concerning and need to go quickly to urgent care. Now, one thing I will say is that the voltage is fairly low in ABL, meaning that the R wave is super small. And if you, again, I point your attention over to V2 and V3, there's something very wrong going on here. So I'll let you think about that for a second. And also, if you look over here in V1, there's a little bit of a biphasic two wave happening. So if you know the answer, go ahead and type it in the chat if you think you know the answer to this. But in V2 and V3, this patient has something called hyperacute T waves. Now, with hyperacute T waves, the definition of them is that they are too big. The T waves are too big for their own QRS, and your T wave should never be too tall. And one of the things that we're trained to think about with this is that maybe the patient has hyperkalemia, but the way that would present is more of a widespread picture of peaked T waves and potentially also a really wide QRS, but this patient doesn't have that. This patient has the really big T waves compared to their QRSs. So five minutes later, five minutes later, this patient actually went on to become a STEMI. And luckily by then, we had already convinced him to go to the emergency room, right? We had already told him, hey, you're going. Now, the hyperacute T waves, just so you know, they were recently recognized in the newest consensus guideline put up at ACC for managing chest pain in the emergency department. And they said, hey, if you see hyperacute T waves, these are a basically like a STEMI equivalent, right? They want you to get these patients to the ED. So the problem with that for a lot of providers is that we're not taught this. And if you're not working in the emergency room, maybe you missed that document. So all you're left with is the machine interpretation, which says ST T wave abnormality. That's a, in my opinion, a recipe for disaster because it's not telling you hyper acute T waves. It's not telling you you need to get the patient to the EV. And you might be tempted to be like, oh, you know, if you didn't know about the stress test, right? Oh, you have some non-specific changes, you know, let's let's get you to cardiology. And if it's anything like our area where we are, it can take a while. So that would obviously be detrimental to the patient. So he got into the emergency department and they did have code STEMI. He went to the cath lab and he got stents in both his circumflex and his LAD, his left anterior descending. So the circumflex feeds one in AVL and you can see that the voltage is super low here. And that was another clue. Voltage, right, is a little bit low here. And then also the LAD feeds V1 through V4 and V2 and V3 had those hyperacute T waves. So we kind of could almost from that anticipate where the lesions would be. Not that we're gonna do that in urgent care anyway, we just wanna find the problem and decide ER or not, right? But it's, it's kind of cool to understand more of the foundations and understand what happens next because the one thing we don't get in urgent care, the patient goes away and then we don't get the follow-up unless perhaps they come back later and we saw what happened. But here's the thing, the very next day, the patient had a lot of chest discomfort. And so the rapid response team was called, responded to his room, did an EKG, and he had ST elevation. And that was really problematic because they were like, well, we know we just put stents in his you know, coronary arteries yesterday. Is he actually really having a STEMI? And it turned out that he was actually having a STEMI and took him back to the cath lab. And they tried to reopen both arteries. They both recluded or restenosed. They couldn't open the LAD, which is obviously the main feeder of the heart, but they could reopen the circumflex. So now if you can imagine this patient's heart is suffering and the, the ejection fraction, which is the squeeze of the heart is going down. And when that happens, it sets a patient up for a whole bunch of other things that are bad. So the next day he went into uh, a time where he said, oh, I feel so awful, I'm having palpitations. Well, if you know that his ejection fraction is low, that he's freshly stented, he's at risk for lethal arrhythmias. And one of those lethal arrhythmias is what he was having. And that, as you can see, is a wide complex tachycardia. And what you would want to do is figure out, is it SVT with aberrancy or 
VTAC. Well, this patient was VTAC, and of course, a 12 lead would help you sort that out. But at the end of the day, this patient ended up, you know, needing therapy and, and went home with a very weak heart. So that's when you start thinking about like guideline directed medical therapy for this gentleman. But time is muscle, right? So it would have been ideal if he got to the hospital sooner, which is why in urgent care, just to kind of tie this back, if your patient is hemming and hawing about going to the ED and you think they need to, a lot of times they're just looking for you to say it's okay to get them off the hook, right? They want your, oh, everything's fine, right? My EKG is normal, so I, I don't have to go, right, right, right? They're trying to get you to like buy off, but don't do it. If you're concerned, time is muscle, get them to the ED. All right, now let's do case two. This is Miss Roberta here. And uh, luckily we saved one patient. Let's continue to save the rest. So Roberta, she's 89, I believe. And she was sitting in her trailer at home and it was at the height of COVID and she didn't have any family visiting and she was feeling very sad and lonely about that. And so she tried to distract herself and she watched the news, but she ended up watching the news for 17 hours in a row in one day. So on the news at the time was a lot of rioting and fires and things. And so uh, Roberto was feeling just a little bit, you know, sad about the world too. So then she realized, well, gosh, I really don't feel good. So she called her neighbor, said, can you come check me out? So the neighbor came over and she said, okay, let's, uh, let's, you know, check your blood pressure. So they checked her blood pressure. It was 170 over 110. So the neighbor was like, oh, this is high, Roberta. You need to go to the hospital. And she also had a little chest pain. You know, she had some dyspnea. So they were like, yeah, let, we'll just go. So they took her to the hospital. And of course she has a diabetic history and a hypertension history. And she's on aspirin. We, we're not really sure why. Um, and also metformin and lisinopril. So they gave her some medications. Her blood pressure came down. But we still obviously need to get an EKG on Miss Roberta. So here's her EKG. And what we have here is just to orient you, this is the 12 lead up here. And then this is the rhythm strips being pulled out. So this is V1. This is the one I think is the best one to see what's going on. Because what you'll notice is, like Jeff was saying in the beginning, that there is an arrhythmia here that we don't want to miss, which would be either this is either this patient was basically going in and out of atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. And so what we do know is it's irregularly irregular and there's no discernible P waves. These almost look like flutter waves here. But either way, whatever you ended up calling this a flutter or a fib, it's the same treatment. And the treatment would be that this patient is at risk for stroke, first of all. And we obviously uh, need to find out why she's an AFib, okay? So that's part of the thing that the, I don't think urgent care ever gets told is, yeah, let's say you see a new onset AFib because it's going to happen. What do you do with that? And are you comfortable prescribing blood thinners? Hopefully you are because this patient also said that I am not able to see out of my right eye since yesterday. I think the flames were just, uh, you know, the flames were burning my eye. That's probably what it is. Well, that's probably not what it is, right? Because the patient probably had a stroke. So in addition to that, we also have another high risk pattern, which is seen in V2 and V3. Are you noticing a pattern with V2 and V3? They're sort of what I like to call the money leads. And what you'll see is you have a biphasic T where it goes up and down in V2 and inverted in V3. And that's a pattern called Wellens warning. And this is also very concerning for LAD occlusion. So with all that being said, gosh, we need to do a few more things on her. And of course, she's going to get a head CT. She's getting the echo. Um, and because of the elevated troponin and the Wellens warning noted in V2 and V3, they're going to do a cardiac catheterization. So her echo showed pretty much almost all the things we needed to see. And they're in the first two lines. So actually, we have an ejection fraction of 32%, which is low, and that is explaining part of what's going on. The other part is that she has distal apical akinesis, which means that the distal part of her heart isn't moving very well. So if you know it, go ahead and type it in the chat if you know what's going on. And the history is really important with her. And also, if I tell you that her coronary arteries were completely wide open, that would also help you get the diagnosis, which was... Takas tubos cardiomyopathy, 
which also is known as broken heart syndrome. So she had broken heart syndrome from watching all the news for 17 hours and feeling lonely. And I just want to do a little commercial here for our elderly folks. Um, they really do feel isolated sometimes. And so even, even your contact with them at the urgent care could be literally the best part of their day. So uh, I always try to be extra friendly knowing that, uh, you know, they don't have a lot of people to talk to sometimes. And so we might be that bright ray of sunshine for them. So she had Takasubos and she went on goal, got down directed medical therapy, similar to what you would do for heart failure. And we told her not to stress anymore. And we told her it'll probably get better in three to four weeks and just be happy, right? Just, you know, don't watch the news anymore. Obviously like, well, if you want to, you can, but no more 17 hour news marathons, like go live your life and, and be happy because that's ultimately the best therapy to getting out of a takosubos. Okay. Now case three, we have Mary. Now I know that you guys are seeing a lot of anxiety right now. And I think everybody is in every setting. The problem is it's hard to ferret out if the patient is anxious because of anxiety or if it's actually something more ominous. So you can see that uh, you saw Mary previously and she's still anxious. So you're like, ah, okay, what do I do? Well, let me dig into her anxiety and ask her a little bit more about what she's feeling. So she says, and let's look at her EKG. She says, yeah, you know, I've been feeling anxious when uh, my heart races. Well, how long, Mary, does your anxiety last? Oh, it lasts like, I don't know, a minute. Okay, well, what are you doing when you feel anxious? I'm just sitting there. Are you thinking about any particular one thing? No, I'm just sitting there. Well, what is, are you having anxiety just when your heart races? Yes. Are you feeling anxious when your heart isn't racing? No, I, I have been fine. Everything's great. Okay, that's easy because now you know that it's a chicken versus the egg thing, right? That her, whatever's going on with her heart is creating the anxiety. So it's tempting to be like, oh, you're anxious, here's a benzo, or you know, here's Wellbutrin or whatever thing you want to use. But in reality, there's something else going on that's fixable with her. And it is possible for people to have anxiety and something else, as you know. So here's her EKG. And type it in the chat if you know what it is. Um, if you already were like, yeah, I see this a mile away because this is a pattern recognition thing. Mary has in, you can see it really well in. V5 and V4, you can see that she has delta waves, okay? And these delta waves are pretty fantastic. And what they, how they're described is they're a slurred up stroke at the very beginning of the QRS, okay? And you'll also know that the P is very close to the QRS. And those two things combined with palpitations should make you very concerned about Wolf Parkinson's white. And this actually is a reason for people to get tachyarrhythmias, which is what was happening to her. So we knew she had a WPW, but then we put a holter on her and we could see that she was going in and out of uh, arrhythmias, which are, are usually going to be AFib with rapid ventricular response or SVT. And if that happens, that in a young person, you always have to think about this as a root cause. And so easily fixed, uh, we'll send her to the electrophysiologist who will be super happy to see her. Now, in the meantime, let's go pop into room James. He looks really happy to be here. Um, he's just a happy-go-lucky kind of guy. And let's see what James is up to. So James, he says, I'm here for a sports physical. Can you just sign this form? I need to get to practice. So he thinks this is a mere formality, but in essence, this is time for us to get to work. So here we go. Let's talk to him about his potential symptoms. So James, he says, well, yeah, I get lightheaded with running sometimes, but it's just because I'm overtraining. Yeah, I did pass out this one time, but it's just because I'm dehydrated. Yeah, sometimes I do have chest tightness with running, but it's just my asthma. I'm fine, really. Whenever a patient says, I'm fine, or trying to sell you car salesman on something else, right? That's not actually happening. Don't take the bait. Keep looking. And in this patient, you're going to absolutely have ammunition to do an EKG and an exam. So when you examine him, you notice he has a murmur that is mid-systolic and it is rough. And an easy thing to do wherever you work, you can put the patient into a down squat, right? Like you can have them squat right there where you are and see if it changes the sound of the murmur. 
if it gets softer with squatting, you're like, oh, okay, first of all, you shouldn't have a murmur. Second of all, squat, you're squatting and it gets softer. Okay. So at the end of the day, I'm now super suspicious for something and we'll see what your EKG says, but you're not playing sports until we sort this out. And then after that, maybe even not then. So here's his EKG and you can see uh, he's probably not going to be smiling anymore because you can see that he has very skinny, narrow dagger cues in one AVL, V5 and V6. And this is a absolute like game changer. Um, and this means that the patient most likely has hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Now, this is not something that is diagnosed on EKG, but it should prompt you to get an echo to make the official diagnosis. So in the meantime, James, my friend, you've got to be benched. No sports for you. And the problem is, is that we're not trained on this in school. And so it's not getting picked up when it should. And so patients are actually for diagnosing it on autopsy when it's too late. So some of the clues are a murmur, looking for those Q waves in 1ABL, V5 and V6, and asking about the priority symptoms. But there's a question that's even perhaps more important than anything I've actually said so far. And that is uh, asking the patient about their family history. So asking them about history of anybody who's died sudden cardiac arrest at a young age is critical. Now, as far as something is in the way, the S4 and the S3 are sometimes appreciated as extra heart sounds because of a stiff wall or a boggy wall. And sometimes the mitral valve won't line up all the way and you'll sometimes hear a mitral gurge, re, re, or a mitral gurge murmur, uh, mitral regurge murmur, say that three times fast. But basically any murmur should concern you or you could have an outflow tract obstruction which can cause the murmur. So any of those things should make you worry. And James, we're gonna get you uh, expedited here to get seen by cardiology. Okay, so the clues are again, all of these things, plus these skinny narrow daggers in one AVL, V5 and V6, as we mentioned. Now, we have another walk-in. This is a busy clinic and we are wearing our tennis shoes today. And our medical assistant says, hey, you got Russell over here uh, and he needs to be seen. He says he's not doing good. I already told him if he's got chest pain, he should go to the ER, but he said, no, because that happens a lot at urgent care, as you know, right? And so uh, Russell, who who looks, his skin signs look great, right? Um, but he says, I have chest pain and it feels like my last heart attack and I feel weak and I, I'm short of breath. So game over for Russell. He's not going to stay in urgent care because it doesn't matter what his EKG said. If he's had a previous stent or a previous MI and he's got the pain that sounds the same, mm -mm. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You're going to go to the ED. But in the meantime, if you're, if he says, I need more convincing. So, okay, let's give you some more convincing. Let's get an EKG. And you can see here that he is EKG. Uh, hopefully you spot this. So type in the chat if anything concerns you here. But the machine says that the patient has a marked ST abnormality. And that is true. It does. But there's actually a STEMI equivalent here. STEMI equivalent. Well, it's not actually, a, if they call it a STEMI equivalent in the new guidelines document, but it's actually a STEMI because we're just not looking at the posterior wall. So we have to get a posterior KG to say yes or no. But I will tell you that even without that, with the amount of ST depression that you have in V2 and V3 and even V4, that this is definitely a posterior MI. And he is, in fact, when this patient presented, he went straight to the cath lab. Uh, posterior EKGs are very rare. Um, if you're going to do one, you just basically move uh, four, five, and six to seven, eight, and nine, and rerun the EKG to see if there's elevation. Because what you're seeing here is reciprocal change. So he is going to the ER, and he is going to go like now because time is muscle. Okay, so we'll find out later uh, how he did, hopefully. And in the meantime, we have another patient. <laughs> Are you guys hungry for a snack by now, right? So this is Kevin. Kevin's got a positive text sign, meaning he's looking at his phone. He feels fantastic. Um, he's feeling kind of sassy today. Uh, and mom brought him in for a palpitations, urgent care visit. And mom says, I just want to be safe. I want to make sure that uh, Kevin's okay. He did call me to get him out of school today. And uh, also I have to get back to work. Will this take long? Um, which in which you reply, well, let's just Let's just ask him some questions and, and see what we can find out. And then we'll, we can decide how long it's going to take. So you look at his vitals. 
and it's 110 over 90. So mm, heart rate 75. Uh, nothing's really jumping out so far that's that's alarming. And he still obviously looks very good. So any, you ask about any history and, and any ROS that's concerning. So he says, yeah, uh, I had the racing heart for 30 seconds and it happened at 11 o'clock. So I called my mom to pick me up at lunch because I was scared. So he also says, and this is a complete red flag. He felt like he was going to die. So we called his mom, another red flag, but he completely feels better now as evidenced by the text sign. And he says, oh, and also I forgot to mention, I had three episodes yesterday and his mom said, you didn't tell me that. <laughs> of course. Right. And uh, the biggest thing that I'm concerned about is his uncle died of something wrong with his heart last year at age 36. And so anybody who died young, non-trauma cardiac arrest, young, anybody in their family, if they complain of anything, be worried. So this kid, um, I'm worried, you know, I'm definitely worried um, about the big ones, the big wolves, um, the big bad wolves. So this patient does have one of the big bad wolves. And so of course the machine software does not tell you what it is, but it, it, this patient does have something ominous and the finding is actually in V1 and V2. Um, so there's two big bad wolves that we look for in my family member died at a young age. And that would be if you have somebody who has uh, Brigada or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So this patient doesn't have the narrow skinny cues in one AVLV5 and V6. They do have in V1 and V2 though, a ski slope type of ST segment. So let me go back to that. You can keep looking at that. And here it is, you can see the ski slope in B1 and B2. But the thing is, there's no reciprocal depression with this. Yes, you have two leads of elevation, but no depression. So the way to tell the difference between a right bundle and this is by the width of the beta angle. So right bundles tend to be a little skinnier. Brigada's complexes in B1 and B2 tend to be a lot wider. So oftentimes we'll say these look like ski slopes, which is why we have a little skier. Um, on the mountain for you. Okay, so that's how to tell the difference. So we'll come back to him at the end too. But now we have another patient who came in who says, I'm fine. I just need to make sure I'm okay. Can you just get a quick EKG? I had a little chest pain and went to my back and I'm totally better with Motrin. So already are your hackles up on this one? Like, well, cardiac pain doesn't get better with Motrin, but okay, we'll get an EKG. Sure, sure. And uh, oh, well, this is a little alarming because we have your EKG and you can see that we have an acute STEMI accusation at the top of the software interpretation. So that doesn't really match. And you're like, well, it's an, it's an MI. I, I got to send you to the emergency department. So you're going to call the ER and the ER is going to say, uh, well, what, what do you think is going on? So you're going to look at the ST elevation and you see some in lead two, three and AVF, which are contiguous leads. And you're like, well, I think it's an inferior wall MI. I think that's what it is. Okay. There's a lot of ST elevation. I'm very concerned. Uh, but if you stop looking there, you don't, you wouldn't notice that there's also some ST elevation, despite it being minimal in V6, V5, and a little in V4. And there's really no reciprocal changes. So that's interesting. Um, so they redo the uh, EKG at, at the ED, you can see that it is still showing the same ST elevation. And you're like, well, so they make the decision to take the patient to cath. And um, they look at his meds. He's on all of these meds. So he has an AFib history. You can tell his vitals are great. Uh, he was afebrile and, uh, you know, had a history of hyperlipidemia as well. So they took him over, did some blood work as well. While he was in the cath lab, they did the blood work. This trope came back negative. His WBC and hemoglobin, not really anything ser serious there. So what was the final outcome of the calf? Well, he had a normal ejection fraction and he had only out of his three, basically four arteries, he didn't have anything significantly occluded. So this actually was not an MI and this actually turned out to be pericarditis. And the way we could know that is because, well, first of all, this was an overread later. They didn't say that initially but because they had ST elevation without any reciprocal changes. And that's part of STEMI definition is to have ST elevation with reciprocal changes. So ST depression. So this one also Motrin is a treatment for pericarditis 
slash, um, well, effusion. And that's why Motrin made him feel better. So anyway, that was kind of a, a fun case to walk through. And uh, hopefully you won't be fooled by this STEMI mimic again. So let's run through Mary. Mary is um, still still a little anxious. Uh, it turned out she did have, um, unfortunately, some baseline anxiety. And, you know, she also has a little sinus Brady. But how much do you really worry about that with Mary? Honestly, she's young. She's athletic. So she's a heart rate of 57. Not worried. Okay. And I know that's always something that kind of triggers us in urgent care or wherever we are. We're like, oh, should I refer to cardiology for bradycardia? So the biggest question to ask there is, are they symptomatic? Meaning, you know, dizzy when standing, um, do they feel weak, fatigue, any of those things, but probably not going to with a heart rate of 57. And then asking them, are you very active? And if she says, yes, I'm very active, then you're good to go. All right. So she had her ablation and you can see her, her T waves are looking a little bit big but it turned out that this her K was fine and she didn't have any ischemia. You can also see there's some T wave inversions here, um, which normally would cause alarm, but her uh, WPW was ablated and she no longer had the slurring or the delta waves, which was great. And James, his outcome, his prognosis was guarded. He did get diagnosed with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. His sports physical was not signed because he can't ever play sports. He was benched and referred and ended up having to get an ICD by the electrophysiologist because he's at high risk to go into sudden cardiac arrest at any moment. Now, we also have um, uh, a walk-in, by the way, unfortunately. And uh, we, we thought we were done for the day, but, but one more guy. And the only reason they let him through is because he said he knows you and he just needs to see you real quick. So obviously he looks uncomfortable. His name's Wayne. And you're like, Wayne, friend, how are you? He's like, not good. And you say, Wayne, why are you not going to the ED? And Wayne says, because I just, I only trust you. And I know you work here at this urgent care and you'll know what to do. So Wayne, he's a little tacky. He's a borderline hypo. He's got some chest pain. He's a dialysis patient and he missed dialysis two days ago. So you're like, Wayne, friend, we're, we're calling 911 and we're going to get an EKG while we're waiting. But uh, 911 is on the way. And he's like, okay, if you think that's best. So you examine Wayne and he's restless, he's pale. You you know, you well, you don't know, but you think you're gonna see some peak T waves probably from hyperkalemia, right? But is that his problem right now? Well, hyperkalemia doesn't cause chest pain, so we have to still have our hackles up. So he's restless, pale, he has a continuous rub. He's got JVD, his lungs are diminished. He's got chronic venous stasis changes. So these are all, at least here, you know, kind of consistent with his chronic disease processes, but we're concerned about something else going on. And so we're going to do that EKG. And once again, we, we have a STEMI accusation in the house. And you can see if you scan through this, if you apply the new thing you just learned of, hey, if I have ST elevation somewhere, I got to keep looking at the rest of my 12 leads. And if you go over here, you can see there's also ST elevation in B4, B5, and B6. And you can see that there's no reciprocal depression. So you're still going to have 911 come because Wayne is really not feeling good. You're not sure it's a STEMI, right? But you're still going to have him come. And you're going to review real quick your STEMI criteria. And you're going to look for, um, I know I have to have one millimeter of elevation. And I know I have to have reciprocal changes. But I don't really have that. But I'm still going to keep the ambulance on the way. But you're going to consider other diagnoses. And uh, going back, we're going to go back. So you can see on the CKG, that he doesn't have any reciprocal changes. And yes, he meets criteria for having one box, one small box, but there's no reciprocal changes. So one thing I would do with Wayne is I would put my stethoscope on his chest and listen for a rub. And if I heard a rub, I would feel a lot better. But the problem is if somebody doesn't have, a, this is a pericarditis EKG, by the way, if somebody doesn't have acute pericarditis, they won't always have a rub because eventually it goes away. And honestly, their EKG can normalize as well. So with him, we're concerned about lots of things. We're concerned about an effusion too, potentially building up um, from his you know, lack of dialysis and also probably his hyperuremic state. We were concerned about hyper-K, but the, the T waves are not peaked. It doesn't mean we're not going to get a K anyway, right? And we're also concerned about acute MI, but he's gotten no reciprocal changes. So with him, we're going to let the emergency department sort it out. I don't think it's unreasonable to do that. But when you call, you can say, hey, 
Um, I do think this is pericarditis because the patient has widespread elevation, no reciprocal changes. Um, and he's, you know, a little tacky. Uh, he was tacky for me and he's a low grade fe fever. So this is what I think is going on and they can evaluate. But if you're not sure, basically here's a way to stay safe. If you're not sure, send them, just send them. It's the easiest, safest thing to do. And we always want to err on the side of protecting our patients. So the summary for today is young people can have cardiac disease too. It doesn't always have to be our, you know, coronary artery disease. It can be things like Wolf Parkinson's white. It could be things like hokum. It can be, you know, Brigada. It's not just about the arteries, right? So if anybody gives you static for doing an EKG on a young patient, you can tell them, I'm not just looking for coronary artery disease, okay? Anxiety is a diagnosis of exclusion. So always have your hackles up and your radar wide open for it being something worse than anxiety. And, and it's a diagnosis of exclusion, making sure they don't have something else. And also remembering that we're gonna be like this little boy, a detective, and making sure that we always look for all these things I'll show on the next slide. And that knowing that patients minimize things sometimes, and a lot of our patients do, but try to really coax it out of them so that you can make the best decision. Don't let them lull you into that false sense of security. So if you can't, you can't find it if you don't know what to look for. So always keep your, um, your eyes open for these things. So these are the five things that I look for in a syncope patient or palpitations. I wanted to share these with you for the end. So I always look for the delta waves or the short PR of WPW, which we saw in Mary. The QTC, I look for that over 450 in men, over 460 in women. I look for the ski slope of Brigada, right? I look for signs of hokum because you wouldn't be able to have them exercise. And of course, I'm always looking for low voltage because that can mean MI, as you saw in Phil's case, uh, or coronary artery disease, or, or it can also mean pericardial effusion. So I'm always looking for these and documenting the lack of or presence thereof. Okay. And finally, thank you so much for being here today for this presentation. My goal was that we would get you some quick wins, some high risk patterns you could go look for as soon as today in clinic and start making a difference as soon as tomorrow. So thank you so much, EBM Medicine, for having me and take it away, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for that presentation. It was uh, truly excellent. So now it's time for some questions from our audience. So um, as a reminder, you can um, click the ask a, ask a question tab at the bottom of your screen and um, submit a question there, or you can upvote other questions that were previously asked. So wait for some questions to come in here. I, I have a question of my own. Could you talk a little bit more about the posterior EKG placement? And I know that's pretty rare. I've never actually done one. Um, but heard about it, but can you walk us through that a little bit? Sure. So um, I, probably the reason that you never have done one, Jeff, uh, and haven't seen one done is because they're very rare. And um, But if you do do, the reason why they're rare is because if you see that much depression, you know that it's a stem, a systemic of the posterior mm -hmm. well, and you just get them to the cath lab. But if you're unsure, you could do, you take your V4, V5, and V6, and you move them to the back. So you basically go, uh, I can show you on me, like V7, V8, and V9 in the back, and then you rerun the EKG, right. and you're looking for only half of a small box of ST elevation, and that would be considered positive. And you only have to have 0.5 millimeters in one of those leads to be considered positive. So it, it's just, it's a matter of being that it's a reciprocal change, what you're seeing in the anterior leads to the posterior, because Whenever you have elevation, you're going to have reciprocal changes somewhere. That just happens to be the somewhere. Right. Okay, excellent. Um, so I know this might be kind of a, a complicated answer, but what is your general approach when looking at EKGs? Kind of where do you start? Yeah, so uh, I actually use a 10-step system that I, I like to employ to keep me safe because I think as providers, well, as people, right, We our eyes always go to the thing that's most interesting. So like on that one EKG with the, the lady who had Takasubos, what what my I wanted to go straight to V2 and V3 because I saw Wellens and I, I love Wellens. But what I do is I, the first step is I do big sick, little sick. And that helps me because if I have a big sick patient, I'm not gonna go do my 10 steps and waste the time because 
like if they have BTAC, which is big sick, or uh, asystole, or hokum, or brigada, or MI, they need to have something happen right now. I don't need to be down in step eight looking at voltage. It's like that's wasting their time. So if I if I see big sick, done. Address the big sick. If it's little sick, I go on and I do rate rhythm intervals. I look at the ST segments and I look for the rest of my steps. That way it helps me get all the things done. And then I go back in at the very end with something called my chief complaint based eyes. And that's like a final look based on what they're complaining of. So I'll go, like if they have chest pain, I'll make sure I look for this, the certain things. If they have syncope, I look for those five things that I just mentioned on the last slide. And that helps keep me safe. Right, okay, great. That's very, very helpful. Um, another question here, what about some pediatric EKG findings that are normal in younger patients, but are abnormal yeah. results? No, good, good question. So I, I actually don't teach on anything pediatric. Uh, in this course or any courses, just because it's not my specialty. And pediatrics is like a whole uh, different thing. So I won't even speculate on knowing that. But yeah, there's, um, I don't even know anybody who does teach pediatric EKG, to be honest. It's like such a hard thing to find. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question about um, AVR ST elevation. How concerning Ooh. is it? Very. So AVR is actually the lead that I love the most for telling you the truth. Um, because if you see ST elevation in AVR, the next thing I do is I look for widespread depression. And that's another thing that is probably a left main occlusion or an LAD occlusion and needs to go to the cath lab urgently. So I wouldn't discharge that patient from urgent care. I would um, get them to the ED if possible, um, or if I could arrange for cath that day or you know talk to a cardiologist, I would do that because that's a hot potato patient. In fact, uh, I do know of a patient who had that finding. It was missed in their routine visit they had that day, mm -hmm. and they ended up going into cardiac arrest that night wow. while waiting for their outpatient stress test. And um, it's just not something you want to mess around with. And it's never going to say what it is on the software interpretation. Sure. So, yeah. Okay, great. Um, how about the significance of inverted T waves and mm. additional needs beyond V1 and 2? Yeah. So actually, um, that's kind of a complicated answer too, but in a, in a really pared down fashion, sometimes you can have an isolated inverted T in lead three. And as long as it's not part of an S1, Q3, T3, it can be normal. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, if you have an inverted T that's somewhere other than AVR and V1, then you have to worry about other things like ischemia being one. So yes, not just V2 and V3, uh, any, any other leads other than AVR and V1, as long as it's not isolated in lead three, you should worry about it. Right, okay. Uh, how do you define a STEMI in a left bundle branch block? Using Scarboza's criteria. Great. So any other questions coming through here? Those were excellent answers. Very, very helpful. Really appreciate that. Yeah, I saw a lot of good answers when I could see the chat again. Uh, a lot of these folks are super, super smart. So thank you guys. Yeah. All right. So that's um, all the time we have for questions today. Um, you can continue this discussion. You can visit uh, ebmedicine.net um, after the presentation. So for the last 10 minutes of today's webinar, I'm going to tell you about a new resource that's exclusively for urgent care clinicians. And I'm excited to share uh, with you all. It's called the Urgent Care EKG course. And if you have any questions during the demonstration, post them in the Q&A um, and I'll answer them afterwards. And if you like what you see, you can click the link um, that'll be in the chat to subscribe. All right, so EB Medicine has served the emergency medicine community for over 20 years. And since April of last year, we've been educating urgent care clinicians with evidence-based practical content. Clinicians, we frequently uh, encounter comment on their lack of confidence in interpreting EKGs. They didn't receive enough training in school, or maybe it's something that wasn't part of their day-to-day -day job prior to entering the urgent care setting. So the urgent care EKG course is gonna provide you with an in-depth review of the 12 lead EKG equipment, coronary artery anatomy, 
We're going to provide you with a detailed 10-step process to accurately interpret EKGs. We're going to reinforce the concepts and information through patient cases that are going to help you to catch life-threatening arrhythmias. And in total, the entire course comes with five AMA Category 1 CMEs. So located on the homepage here, you can see the 10 modules, which start with an overview of EKG principles, we'll talk about physiology, rules to guide and inform your EKG interpretation, cardiac anatomy, hallmark EKG findings, a chief complaint-based approach, all things T-waves, and we wrap up the modules with case studies, real-life door-to-door scenarios, and practice exercises, including 20 actual EKGs. We also include a module specifically for tips for the urgent care clinicians. So let's jump in to basic arrhythmias. So the basic arrhythmia module is about 30 minutes long. It's gonna cover the hallmark EKG findings of sinus tack, sinus brady, six sinus, AFib and flutter, BTAC, torsades, all of the different heart blocks. So Jennifer is going to break down rhythm strips step by step, as well as full 12 lead EKG interpretations. So Jennifer's expertise is going to help guide you or your clinicians to gain a solid foundation in EKG interpretation, provide you with the knowledge and understanding needed to safely manage a patient who presents to the urgent care that requires an EKG. At EB Medicine, we understand the importance of providing you with information in multiple formats. Uh, explaining the content in a variety of different ways to give you the opportunity to practice and reinforce your learning. After working through the modules and acquiring the foundational knowledge needed to accurately interpret 12 leads, you'll have the opportunity to practice with 12, um, to practice with 20 actual EKGs and establish best practices that you can take with you to your next shift. Our expert instructor is going to help guide your interpretation of real life patient scenarios. So the principal course materials are going to include uh, terms and definitions, as well as the 20 EKGs that can be printed out, marked up as you study to reinforce your methodology for interpretation. You'll also be provided all of the slide deck as well to print. So the Urgent Care EKG course is going to provide you with an easy to access videos that are engaging and are gonna be available on your mobile device or your laptop. It's gonna break down the must know patterns that have not been taught in your training. It provides you with strategies for addressing chief complaints and chest pain and shortness of breath patients. So I personally know how intimidating EKGs can be, how I used to feel overwhelmed and scared when someone would come into my clinic complaining of chest pain or shortness of breath. The, Ur the urgent care EKG course helps clinicians build confidence empowers us to practice at the type of our top of our license and improves outcomes for some of our sickest patients. So you've made it through the entire demonstration here, made it to the end. Um, and uh, with that, you can, if you like what you see, you can click on the link in the chat um, to order and subscribe at the ebmedicine.net slash EKG with a 20% discount uh, for attending today's webinar. If you are part of a group or need to train a large number of clinicians, you can visit ebmedicine.net slash groups to contact us and learn more. And that will wrap us up today. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. Um, and uh, the slides and video of this will be available a few days afterwards. Please look for your email for updates on all of that. And thank you again for joining us.